I'm Dr. J.J. Hurtak, and I'm presenting with my wife, Dr. Desiree Hurtak. We are social scientists, specialists in space law. We are directors in the organization called the International Space Development Authority, as well as members of the Economic and Social Council at the United Nations, which puts together position papers for diplomats dealing with issues on Earth and in space. We're going to take a look now at some aspects of what we will call the commercial versus the non-commercial mindset that is involved in the Mars story as we entertain our theme, social and legal requirements for establishment of human life on Mars. Primary question is why life on Mars and beyond? There are different stakeholders, as you can see, in science, the question is to understand the universe, technology to move into unknown realms, commerce and finance to look at economic benefits, security to look at stability and security of new frontiers, government policy to look at outer space and global peace, and civil society to look at expanded awareness. But do the space laws we have suffice, or are they outdated? The Declaration of Legal Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space lead to the Outer Space Treaty, the Rescue of Astronauts Agreement, the Liability Convention, the Registration Convention, and the Moon Agreement Treaty. The Outer Space Treaty was ratified by as many as 103 countries with additional 26 countries as signatories. The Moon Treaty, however, had only 16 countries ratify it. The major countries, the US, the USSR, and China did not participate in signing. The Moon Treaty, of course, is very important because it's been the stepping stone between various controversies and interpretations of space law behind the scenes. So who makes the international space law? The United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs created two working groups, the CPLA, the Committee on Policy and Legal Affairs, and Space Applications Section, SAS. CPLA supports the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space created in 1959 with two subcommittees, the scientific and technical as well as the legal. Recently, under the present administration, a document known as 2010 Codification USC or Code Title 51 brought together over 500 chapters dealing with legalese, clarifying certain laws relating to national and commercial space programs as title laws and insurance indemnification, international cooperation, microgravity research, pricing policy for commercial and foreign losers, and space launches and capabilities of what is involved. However, these do not change the established national and state codes. However, they provide a unified national model for adoption in space. We have recently had, of course, in May of this year, House Bill 2262, which allows corporations to look at quote unquote, development on asteroids. And this, of course, has not cleared the Senate, but it's a turning point, we believe, in the commercialization of outer space. And so with the expansion of the scientific frontiers going on in China and the new directions of Russia, we believe that there will be modifications and reinterpretations in the nuances of the UN laws and treaties. So if we're going to understand space laws, we must first understand how we can work together on Mars, the social, the economic, and the legal context. And of course, we've seen from the great work of the Mars Society on Devon Island and the Arctic Circle, as well as in the state of Utah at the Mars Desert Research Station, marvelous examples of preparing people for a new society in outer space, or what I would call the creation of a space kind with no limits the umbilical cord with Mother Earth is being broken. 
However, there were earlier projects such as Mars 500, which between the years 2007 and 2011 saw three different crews of six volunteers live and work together in mock-up spacecraft for periods of 15 days, 105 days, and 520 days. However, this was pretty much a confinement situation where there was not really the rigors of outer space research working in new environments. And of course, we have this new direction of looking at the components of what will hopefully take us into something equivalent to Mars One, the first private mission to Mars. Yesterday and today, we have heard arguments pro and con. And by the year 2027, a selected few will have a one-way trip to Mars. This is the brainchild of Bas Lansdorf, who has raised only approximately $700,000 and plans most of the other six billion to come from a TV reality show. Well, the bottom line, as you have heard, really comes together with the, the budgetary considerations and a good economic strategy that may uh, have to bring in other key players. Presently, the 20 settlers that are expected to be there by 2033 have been moved now to 2050 AD. Well, we can also look back to Biosphere 2. Going back to the early 90s, my wife and I were privileged to be there as some of the first uh, observers as social scientists. The Biospherians encompassed eight people who were sealed off for two years inside Biosphere 2, which was a 3.14 acre glass enclosure located in Oracle, Arizona. Unfortunately, of the 3,000 entered species, many became extinct. Also, during the first year of Biosphere's two-year two mission, there were low amounts of food to eat, and the experimenters were literally in a state of semi-starvation and lost between 11 and 16 percent of their body mass. One might uh, look at one of the key participants who went from a 205-pound weight to 156. There are also states of depression, irritability, fatigue, and mental fog. In the end, the eighth crew members were split into two factions, and some could not even talk to the others unless absolutely necessary. And that was all within the first nine months. So there are confinement, environmental, psychological factors that are very important. Principal problems were one, environmental problems with oxygen, carbon controls causing lethargy, sleep, apnea, and breathing difficulties, where additional oxygen had to be added to the system. And growing food for the first year was insufficiently causing health problems. Secondly, psychological problems, the group split into two factions, turning allies into enemies and generosity into selfishness. Some of this has been seen in the Antarctic research, what is known as the ICE, CE research of being isolated, confined, and under extreme environmental control. The work of Professor Lawrence Polinkas of San Diego, California, has suggested that after looking at the Antarctic missions, there are three of four principal factors which come into play. One, social coherence. It's important to have a woman involved because it makes people less aggressive in the team relationship. Variations in moods are essential. And three, estimates of personality pre-mission status are not as accurate as estimates of individuals in in situ situations. There was also a second mission in March 6, 1994. Over when this was to last less than two years, unfortunately, the outside management fell apart when the investors they pulled the plug. And one of the managers of the project opened the door of the biosphere habitat to make sure the inside people knew about it as they had lost communication with them. This was a disaster. Our conclusion is that although science and technology are critical in going to Mars and keeping colonists healthy, we also need to focus on human challenges before us. Challenges of human relations, human communications, human organization, and space law is important. And so the underlying web of all of this is the new regime of space law that will allow this reciprocity between, quote unquote, a new phase of human evolution to be successful.
now I'm gonna ask Desiree to continue. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about space law, and of course time is short here, but uh, as we move forward, what are the laws that are necessary? And of course there's so much great technology that exists or is going to exist that we've been hearing about today, uh, but really to get a pure social return on investment and life on Mars, we need to look at laws. And I like to follow uh, James, who was here earlier, talking about the early laws that made our country great. But what else is there? Well, we look at the Space Shuttle, uh, International Space Station program, and what we see is various countries coming together. The yellow, if some of you are familiar with this, being the US, the red, the Russians. Then there's little modules connected with Japan, Europe, Canada, Italy, and Brazil. Technically, there were about five major countries that came together to create this intergovernmental agreement. But what it says is important. First of all, it allows the space station partners to extend their national jurisdiction to outer space so that the elements they provide are assimilated to the territory of the partner states. The basic rule is that each partner shall retain jurisdiction and control over the elements it registers and over personnel in and on the sta station. This is Article 5 of the Intergovernmental Agreement. Now, I disagree a little bit with James, who said earlier that probably the US will go, and then Russia will go, and then the Amazon Corporation will go. I think the first group of people going will be international, and I think you have to have some sort of interconnection. Although what laws are needed in Mars, I don't think that it's going to be so easy to exchange lettuce leaves like we recently saw at the International Space Station. It really was hard to grow food in strange environments as we saw with Biosphere 2. So what we really need is starting at least at the very beginning from Earth, some sort of organization, legal structure that will monitor and manage the differences that are going on. One of which could be the United Nations, and Dr. Jack and I have an organization, Academy for Future Science, which works at, as an NGO at the United Nations, so we followed a lot of their work. There's also COSPAR, which is the Committee of Space Research, which is connected with the International Council of Science. And we're also proposing maybe an organization, a new organization strictly relating to Mars that connects with the United Nations. Uh, negotiations obviously have to go beyond just governments. They're going to have to involve agencies like NASA, but also environmental agencies, NGOs, industry. I love the fact that Mars One is including the media, but how do they fit? Can they film anything? Is there controls? What's the situation? And of course, civilians. This is all extremely important. So I think we all agree on this. Uh, the colonists should focus and the law should focus on particularly the first two, health and safety of those that are out in space or on Mars. Also, third party liability. This is extremely important. Who's to blame when something goes wrong? We would also add, and I think that's where everything is going, is having private space activities to help fund pro the projects. And also, strongly, we personally believe in sustainable development, watching what's going on on the asteroids or on Mars to make sure things are not really irreversible in a certain sense. So what types of laws? Because we want to talk about law. Well, in the US, we pretty much work with criminal law, civil law, common law, and statutory law. And there's also international law, which we would classify also as space law, and constitutional law. Let's take a look at criminal law. Most of us know this, uh, thou shall not steal, that you shouldn't kill. These are things that have been around forever. And that's why you have uh, a consensus, really, for the International Criminal Court, which actually is an independent organization. There's also the International Court of Justice, which is connected with the United Nations, but it pretty much works with bringing countries uh, that need to bargain together. It does have judges, by the way. So uh, obviously Mars colonists would have to accept the most basic criminal laws. This is something that no matter where they are uh, working with, they would have to understand that maybe the International Criminal Court would be willing to step in on that. Then there's civil law. And I think what's really exciting about this is stuff like family law. And some of you might think it's not civil or family, but you have questions of 
what about abortion on Mars? I mean, that sounds stupid, but what happens when there's 100 people up there and someone wants one? I mean, is this something, or maybe it's going to be inbred in the system because there's not enough ma you know, food. They, these are questions. Gay rights marriage. Do you realize Australia doesn't allow for gay rights marriage, but we do. So who makes the decisions on these very, very basic issues that would come up when we start moving people onto Mars? Maybe some of these ideas are far out, but there's also very practical civil laws, like liability. And the International Space Station has an intergovernmental agreement that has a very strong cross waiver of liability, which means pretty much that no one can sue anybody else, not only countries, but you can sue the contractors, and you can't sue the partners, and you really can't sue the workers. So that's a very strong thing that's, I think, kept a lot of this going. And I hope Mars One has a very strong waiver of liability as well. And of course, things with space tourism, they also need a very strong uh, waiver of liability because we had one accident, sadly, for Virgin Galactic. But what happens when there was a whole team of people up there? And to be honest, right now, according to the Outer Space Treaty, even if Mars One had a very strong waiver of liability in place, the Dutch government, not Mars One, could be sued for people who lost their lives. And this is, I think, something that will come up over and over again. Uh, you know, when you're tr starting to push the envelope, you know, there's all these people that start coming back to you and saying, well, I didn't understand this, or it wasn't strong enough, or whatever. One of the most interesting things, and uh, I know someone just asked about this, is Planetary Resources. That's the name of the company that has James Cameron from Avatar as an advisor, that has Larry Page, Eric Schmidt, and also Richard Branson as um, investors. And when they had a problem with the October Antares rocket mission, what did they do when they lost a lot of their stuff that they were sending up on that? They decided to create their own uh, return uh, spacecraft called the Acrid 3. And that already made it up in July to the uh, International Space Station. It's already starting to start doing its experiments. I mean, you have really intelligent people. And I think that's why uh, there was that recent, someone just mentioned, it's called the, uh, the House Bill, uh, I think it's 1508, that is actually, it's from the United States government. It hasn't passed the Senate yet, but it said that the American government will support corporations mining asteroids. Now, how does this relate to the Outer Space Treaty? Well, many people have, they like to rewrite uh, situations, and they've said, well, the Outer Space Treaty means no nuclear, it also means no country can own, because it was written right before we landed on the moon, and they didn't want the US to own the moon. But looking and talking to lawyers, especially our friend Declan O'Donnell, who we work with on the International Space Development Authority, he believes that it does allow for private companies to come in and to exploit. And I think the US is backing the situation, knowing that we do have the rights, even with the Outer Space Treaty, not the US government but individual private corporations. And then this will be, of course, in the courts when these things really happen. And one of the other things I think we have to consider is private sector corporations. We heard from James earlier about the fact that it was like, well, we'll say the British East Indian Company or other corporations that first took over the landings of uh, things on the US and in India. I think corporations will have to watch because they will try to take control. You won't have labor unions. You'll have a lot of things that you'll have to protect. So that's extremely important. Uh, a couple other things, common law. As, uh, this is case law made by judges. Obviously, there will be common law connected with, um, or case law connected with uh, Mars. Unique things that we've never even thought of will be brought. But how do you do that? Do you have, someone said today it was 44 minutes to get information back and forth. Maybe it is just three minutes, as, some, as one of the other speakers said. But you can imagine doing a court where some of you are on Mars and some of you are down on Earth and you have to go back and forth. I mean, this is going to be not an easy thing. But there's probably not going to be any judges on Mars. So these are things that um, the International Institute of Space Law, organized by the Manfred Locke Space Law Moot Court Competition, has done annually since 1992, where they've taken young law students from Africa, from the US, from China, and from Europe, all in their own regions, and actually ask these questions, you know, 
gotten some of these ideas going. So there's a lot of interesting things that people are looking at. I'll close my part again and introduce my husband once again with the idea of international law and space law. Again, a lot of this is from the United Nations. And the real question is extra commercia versus res communis. Res communis is what most people think we have. Extra commercia is what we're moving into, which is, of course, obviously commercial activity is applicable. We strongly think you need uh, environmental protective zones if you're going to do this. Declan thinks we can do this. If everyone knows who Declan O'Donnell is, he was one of the legal counsels for the Mars Society. He's been with us for a long time. Couldn't be with us this year. But he feels that even the Moon Treaty actually allows for private enterprise. Maybe some benefit sharing for everyone. Maybe like, you know, you have to like give some of the money back to the poor countries of the world. But he does believe that we can do this. So um, also, we don't probably need to maybe move out of the uh, Outer Space Treaty. Maybe we can just alter it a little bit. So now with Dr. Hertak. So this is Declan's position that uh, maybe we put the International Space Court on the International Space Station. And certainly there are nuances in the Outer Space Treaty that would allow non-state players to participate. And so this is all up and for grabs the reinterpretation of what is commercial development in outer space. Well, we go back to the wonderful work of Jerry O'Neill from Princeton back in the mid-70s. I was privileged to be with one of the groups at Stanford University, and our friend Rick Gladys provided NASA this wonderful picture of life in the Stanford Taurus in outer space, where all of the amenities of life on Earth, the changeable, recyclable environment will be there, blue sky, and movable sails to accommodate the different environments that we need. Of course, the ecologists took this idealism to task because it overlooked certain situations of space and just the mechanisms of ecology. Professor uh, Matthew Eakin and I authored a space treaty protective law uh, proposal in 2005 in relationship to Mars mineral and the other national resource activities should they occur, the parties like knowledge to A, protect the Mars environment and, and associated ecosystems, B, respect other legitimate uses of Mars habitats, three, maintain zones for microbiological samples, and four, establish a court system on the International Space Station and our Mars that addresses integrated business, operational strategy, and scientific competition. This would be real-time turnabout by people who are astronauts or legal scholars out there in space rather than waiting for this time lapse transmission. A Mars Mineral and Other Natural Resource Regulatory Committee could be established by the UN or a Mars Commission. Quote, each country represented by the UN shall be entitled to be represented by the committee and to appoint representatives who may be accompanied by experts and advisors. Therefore, our proposal is to call for an establishment of an International Mars Space Committee, establishing this committee in a nonpartisan area of venue like the United Nations for major negotiations would expand the multilateral context of decision-making used for outer space, technologies, and exploration. The UN Permanent Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in Vienna, Austria, we believe should be the origin of this IMSC. Eventually, Mars may have its own constitutions, and creating a constitution would be the epitome of creating its own sovereign entity. And so we're moving more and more to recognizing that we're going to eventually break the umbilical cord with Mother Earth. We will become a space kind, a new chapter in evolution. Now will we take the flag on the, the moon and the work of uh, the geologist Harrison Schmidt to a sister planet, we might go there directly, but we must also take the the space law regime that we need to participate together. Do we send more probes to investigate if life is found, or do we put up a do not disturb sign? This is very important. And the and Arctic tr Treaty does have provisions for mineral rights as well as for flora and fauna. So the reinterpretation, as I've argued in some of my scientific papers, does make applications that are important and responsible. Whatever we do, we should be bound by the principles of responsibility and international accountability to treat life in outer space with the same dignity according to life on Earth. So this is res communis ex nullius, or first come, first serve, extra uh, commercium, commercial activities applicable in some instances to those
who have the wisdom and have the technological know-how. Now, there are other scenarios of what happens with the use of dual-use technologies, dual-use technologies such as lasers, high-power lasers not only for mining and exploration, but they could be used for military purposes. Uh, through accidents or robotics, there could be other situations which brought about a new space law treaty composed by my colleague, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, Dr. Carol Rosen, formerly a Fairchild, and Dr. Scott Jones, consultant to the late Senator Claiborne Pell of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This was an Outer Space Security and Development Treaty brought out in 2011. This is very important because it establishes a framework and procedures to assure that space on Mars will be a neutral realm from which all classes of weapons are banned and from which no hostile action shall be taken towards Earth or the surrounding cosmos. So the loopholes are filled in here. Parties to this treaty reaffirm the urgency of preventing a destabilization, threatening and costly arms race in space. Also, the recognition that information and data
I, unfortunately, because without a microphone, we can't hear the finer nuances of your question, but essentially, uh, because of time considerations, let's talk about this privately outside. And of those of you who have technical questions or legal questions, we can meet with you uh, outside this program uh, schedule, which is very tight. I would say. Uh, Declan Donnell, O'Donnell and I and Desiree will be publishing papers on this. Uh, we have several um, documents on the reinterpretation of the UN treaties. We also acknowledge the importance of the, the commercial thrust that must be maintained if we are going to make use of the resources of outer space. We must go beyond the traditional dualism of trying to divide the UN camp against private enterprise realized that we have solutions by a new generation of social and legal thinkers who realize that space exploration means space habitation with commercial derivatives. Again, we thank you and apologize for the technical uh, problems 